Well, welcome to Playing from the Second Chair. This is our lesson six, and we're so glad to have you with us here tonight and also those that are joining us by video. Appreciate you being a part of this study. And uh, tonight I want to focus my attention on the subject of serving from a war zone. Uh, you know, the Bible likens us to several things, uh, sheep, uh, warriors, racers, runners and all different types of things but um, and sometimes we can go to extremes on that I've known some that were such warriors that they were uh, militant you know all dressed in camouflage and then you've got others that such servants that they think they're on a cruise ship instead of a battleship so tonight I want to kind of work a little balance in that talk about David and Saul usually our warfare honestly does not just come from the enemy our real warfare comes from those that are walking in the flesh when we're trying to walk in the spirit and they don't see things from a spiritual standpoint. They see it from a fleshly standpoint. And this is kind of the contrast of what we're seeing in the life of David and Saul. And uh, I, I want us to look a little bit about the power of preparation and, uh, and really examine Saul's life. Saul had nothing before in his past to prepare him to be king because Saul was the first king of Israel but he was promoted from being donkey chaser <laughs> to being king. They, there was no preparatory time at all and uh, it's important to understand that the greatest danger you can ever face is to be promoted to a position without preparation and character because it literally becomes a setup for a downfall because the flaws in your character start being exposed when the pressure hits. And um, so Samuel goes to anoint Saul, and I think the first line of this verse really gives us an understanding. It says, Samuel took a bottle of oil and poured it on Saul's head. Uh, some translations say a vial, but it's important to understand whatever it says, it's a human instrument that's anointing a fleshly king. When David is anointed, he's anointed with a ram's horn. Something had died previously to his anointing. And believe me, the preparation will cause something to die in the flesh. Years ago, I was asked the question of how can you tell when somebody's spiritual? And uh, I think sometimes we try to judge that from various things. But really, the best definition I've ever read about spirituality is your level of spirituality is equal to your level of death to the flesh. That's exactly how spiritual you are. If you're not dead to the flesh, believe me, you're not alive in the spirit. And so it says it took the bottle of oil and he poured it on Saul's head and he kissed him and said, has not the Lord chosen you to be the ruler over his land? And when you leave me today, you will meet two men by Rachel's grave, the land of Benjamin in Zelzak. And they will say unto you, the donkeys you went looking for has been found. Now your father has stopped worrying about the donkeys and are worried about you saying, what should I do about my son? Now, flaws are hidden. Most of the time you don't see a flaw. In fact, uh, I'll tell you a story about myself, but years ago, I, I, I'm a very oddly shaped person in case y'all hadn't noticed. But anyway, um, I'm very short legged, <laughs> bigger waist, and I just can't buy pants off the rack unless they're sweatpants with elastic at the bottom. But I was with Deb and we was in this place and uh, they were kind of a factory outlet and they sold what they would call irregular pants. And uh, irregular fits me perfect. Apparently that's my size, I'm irregular. But anyway, what ended up happening was these pants had a flaw in the cuff and they had a flaw in the seat of the pants, but it was very low. You couldn't see it. And uh, so I told Deb, we got to cut off a yard of these pants anyway. It don't make any difference if the hem's messed up. So she was going to do all the altering and stuff. But she was concerned about the flaw, but I was not concerned about the flaw. But I went to a church service, and I had some notes, and I was about to preach. And all of a sudden, it blew off the pulpit. And when I reached down, pressure met flaw. 
And, sud and suddenly, the best way I can put it, I was fully exposed. So it's important to understand that flaws are not seen usually till pressure is put on a situation. So this is a point I want to show you now. Saul had the flaws all along, and it was partly because there was no preparation. And we see the character flaws very early in his life. And the first character flaw is on his coronation day. He's hiding among the stuff. I don't know how much stuff they had, but for like us, they had plenty. And he was hiding among the stuff because he was insecure. And, and insecurity is something that nobody else can deal with but you. Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one can make you feel insecure without your permission. So when there's a problem with insecurity in your life, it's something no one else can help you. They can, they can brag on you. They can comfort you. They can affirm you. But if you're insecure, you're insecure. And let me just say in leadership is where I find the most of insecurity. I know preachers, you know, that can't go to a football game because when they huddle up, they think they're talking about them, you know. I mean, they're just insecure. And, and the problem with insecurity is it's you. It's your own view of you. And so Saul is hiding. He's a tall guy, head and shoulders above everybody in Israel, but he's hiding among the stuff because of the way he sees himself. And uh, this shows up quickly, and Paul's problem is this insecurity starts a seedbed for his downfall. And unfortunately, his greatest day as king was his coronation day, and everything began to go downhill from there because of the flaw of insecurity. And uh, I encourage people, insecurity a lot of time is a result of operating in a place you're not gifted. Deb and I was talking on the way over here, and, uh, you know, I know the areas that God has gifted me in. I also am equally aware of the areas that I'm not gifted in. And uh, how many of you know it's better if you stay out of the areas you're not gifted in? And uh, I, I've heard people say, you know, I believe God called me to sing. And as soon as I heard the first verse, I'm thinking, no, God didn't have anything to do with it. How many of you know you'll have some kind of, of uh, you know, a particular gift if, if God's calling you to do it? And so if you can find out why you're on the earth and you're carrying out your plan. And they were praying for a king. And a guy shows up that's tall and good looking. So they decide he's the king. And so they take a bottle of oil and pour over his head and uh, he moves from donkey chaser to king of Israel. And that's a big jump, especially without preparation. And um, the next thing you see in his life is anger. He's got an anger management problem. And, uh, you know, I know, again, our insecurities seem to... Uh, to trigger anger in us. We feel like we're not understood. Saul probably was, uh, I don't know, made fun of maybe even in his neighborhood because he was taller than all the other kids because if you don't look like everybody else, then suddenly uh, you're, you're weird. And so I don't know what his seed bed for anger was. Uh, he's from the tribe of Benjamin, which was one of the smaller tribes. Maybe he just felt insignificant. I don't know. Maybe it was his upbringing. The Bible doesn't really say, but we do know this. He's got an anger problem. And, and the pressure's now on him. And how many of you know when things are going good and you're not under pressure, you can control anger. <laughs> but when you're under pressure and it's already a flaw, then it will erupt over time. And then the third thing about him is he's afraid. He's afraid. And this fear is driving him. And uh, he feels like he's got something to prove because of his own fear. And again, fear is something you got to realize is not from God. You know, the Bible tells us in the book of Timothy, chapter 1, verse 7, God's not giving you a spirit of fear. And, and notice what he calls it, a spirit of fear. And so we got to recognize fear. Now, there's some things that are rightful fears, and there's some things that are foolish fears. And uh, some have no logic behind them. You know, I think it's probably smart to have a certain amount of fear of rattlesnake or tarantula. But a lot of people are afraid and flinching over things that are not even real. And they've got fears that are abnormal. And a lot of times they come out of some treatment in the past or something they think that's going to be found out about them. And I know some people's angry just to keep people at arm's length so that they don't come close enough to see the flaws. We don't really know. We just know he has fear. 
He has anger. He has insecurity. Now, this leads him to operating in his flesh. He's already in his flesh. And uh, all of us at one time or another has been in the flesh. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> you know, I, I know there's a difference between occasionally spilling the milk and pouring it out. And, and we've got to understand we're going to make mistakes. And any leader that tells you he's not going to make mistakes, uh, watch him. He'll lie to tell you about other stuff. But anyway, it's more than just his flaw of his insecurity, his anger, and fear. He also has a problem with disobedience. He thinks because he's operating in the flesh that he can offer God some ideas. Anybody ever been there? When you feel like, you know, I don't know exactly how God functioned until I showed up to advise him because my prayer life is talking more about what I think he ought to do <laughs> instead of getting orders of what I'm supposed to do. And uh, the battle of the flesh is, is in reasoning. When we think our mind overrides his spirit. Now, when you read the word of God, you'll find out if you're operating by reason, you're going to disobey God a whole lot. Because when he tells you Hosaphat in battle to run towards him singing, that's not reasonable. When he tells Moses to stick out a stick over water when there's a war going on and an army behind him fully clad, that's not reasonable. But how many of you know it's smarter to obey God than it is to obey your own mind and to think that you've got something to add to the mix? And so God tells him to slay these animals. And of course, I'm giving you scripture reference for all this. His insecurity is found in 1 Samuel 10, 22. It's, his anger in, in chapter 11, 6, his fear in 13, 1, uh, 11 through 12, and now his disobedience in 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 24. God tells him to go down and completely destroy this army that had been an enemy of Israel for a long time. And what does he do? He goes down and decides that he's going to keep the sheep, quote, so that he could sacrifice them to God. And Samuel shows back up, and he's totally disobeyed God. How many of you know that you can't partly disobey God? <laughs> Actually, you either disobey God or you obey God. And if there's areas where you've not released the rope, you're still playing tug of war with him. So you're going to have to listen to what he tells you to do. And, and I think that's the smartest thing any of us can do. But his disobedience comes in. He, he saves these, these sheep because they're adding to his wealth. And in his mind, they make him more secure. They make him less afraid. He's got more things. I know people like that that think if they can surround themselves with things, all of a sudden they'll feel more secure. How many of you know it's a lie from the pit? It won't make you more secure. And so he disobeys the Lord. And when uh, Samuel comes to confront him, Saul says to him, oh, I obeyed the Lord. And Samuel just merely says, then why is the bleeding of the sheep in my ear? Where'd it come from? And then he starts trying to justify and I'll tell you this, that is one of the greatest indicators that you're operating in the flesh when you feel a need to defend your actions. Because if you're operating by the Spirit of God, you don't have to defend God at any time. You just obey Him. Amen? So if you've got this thing of trying to justify yourself, then you're operating in the flesh. And so He's disobedient. And then all of a sudden, he realizes he's disobedient, and, and actually Samuel goes on to tell him, the Lord's displeased with you, and you're going to lose the kingdom because you're operating in the flesh. And then guilt set in. And uh, if there's any message that I think the world needs to hear is found in Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus who walk not after their flesh, but after the Spirit. Now, why is that important? Because guilt will separate you from the relationships that are necessary for you to succeed because you start feeling this thing and you start imagining and then you start isolating yourself and then you start closing yourself off and after a while, you're in the company of one. And then you're, you've got all these defense mechanisms because guilt makes you feel that way. I've, I've operated under that. I, I've been to where I was afraid to pray because I didn't feel like I had done enough 
<laughs> for God to even answer my prayer. I remember at one time being so foolish early on in my life that I would sit down and read 10 chapters and try to catch up everything I was supposed to before I did pray because I just want to make sure I got some brownie points with God. Anybody ever, anybody I can tell by the laughter, I'm not alone. But anyway, let me explain to you, you don't get anything from God because you earn something. It's all grace. How many of you know we are totally unworthy? We just need to come to the understanding of that. And I used to prop people up. They would come to the altar, and, and I'd give an altar call, and they'd say, Brother Rick, I, I'm unworthy. And, and I used to try to make them feel better about themselves. And now I just agree with them wholeheartedly. Absolutely. <laughs> You're completely unworthy. <laughs> Therefore, there's grace available to you. I put on Facebook here a while back, the amazing thing about grace is it's only there for people that don't deserve it. If you think you deserve it, it's a reward. Amen. <laughs> it's a reward. Grace comes to you because you're undeserving and unworthy and all of those other things you want to add. Just keep piling on the adjectives because the truth of the matter is you've got to come to the realization you, you're not worthy. And he's totally worthy. And then he can impart his grace to you. And so he's operating in guilt now. And he's trying to get people to prop him up. He even tries to get Samuel to prop up his life. Come and show them that I'm still okay. And, and I know people that do this as well. I know leaders that want you to prostitute. Listen to me. Want you to prostitute your gift and your influence to support a character flaw in their life. Have you ever been there? Somebody inviting you in so they can use your anointing, your credibility, your character to support their lack. And you got to be aware of this. And so it's important to understand that guilt should be turned into conviction in order to draw us to God and not push us away. Guilt will push us away, conviction will draw us. And you can tell the difference between condemnation and conviction by which way it's drawing you. If it's repelling you from God, that's condemnation because Jesus is saying, come unto me, all you that labor, and I'll give you rest. Come unto me. Take my yoke upon you. And so he's calling us to him. And uh, so that's why guilt will work to to perform what it does in our life, and it pushes us away from the very things we need. Now, let me give you another thing that's a big, big thing, a character flaw in the life of Saul, is his jealousy. And again, jealousy boils back, and I just get real brave. I'm going to walk where angels fear to trod right here. But how many of you know if you're jealous of someone, it has nothing to do with that person. It has to do with your own insecurity. Amen. It has to do with your own insecurities. I remember when Debbie and I married, I told her, I said, now listen to me. I'm from the mountains, and we don't shake hands in the mountains. We hug. And so we're going home, and I'm going to be hugged by gobs of people, and those that forget to hug me, I'm going to hug them. And so let's just settle. We're together. You chose me. I chose you. We're together. We're going home together. <laughs> so let me just explain to you. If you're going to be jealous, this is going to be a rough ride for you because... I'm a hugger. I'm a hugger. I, I find myself patting people at Walmart. I just, I'm just an affectionate person. And, and really just realize we're, we're going home with each other. So just don't be carried away by jealousy. How many of you know the Bible says jealousy is as cruel as a grave? It'll kill you. And, and Saul is jealous of everyone around him, and it's because of the character flaws that I begin to tell you. So we see him going down from the guilt to 1 Samuel 18, 7 and 8. He's jealous. He's jealous. And jealousy leads him to his seventh flaw and the end of his reign, and that's when he tries to kill the other people. God help us not to let that kind of jealousy come to, it develops into hatred and then comes into murder because it can happen. And let me just say murder is not necessarily, you know, cutting somebody's head off. You can murder people with your tongue. You can murder people through your actions. You can murder people in a bunch of different ways. And it's important to understand that your true enemy is a person that's trying to destroy your influence. It usually comes through comparison, you know. Well, we think if we cut their legs off, it makes us appear to be taller. And all it does is just reveal 
that your heart has become hardened and you've turned away from God. And so it's important to understand that. So we see the character flaws in the life of King Saul. And because of these character flaws, when the pressure was on, he, like myself, was fully exposed. And uh, it all started with the fact that his character wasn't developed when he took the job. One of my major prayers, and I'm going to share it with you, I have prayed my entire life, God, please don't promote me past my character development. Wherever you bring me, let me at least have the character to stand there and not bring a reproach on you or those that you've called me to lead. I, I would rather just be a deckhand on the Queen Mary than captain of my own kayak and it's sinking. I, I, I want my character to really be the foundation for my gift. And if it's not, doesn't really make any difference how gifted you are. And so we see these things happening in the life of Saul, and you can see him begin to diminish his ability to lead. And so I tell people all the time, you know, we can judge other people and all that kind of stuff. It's better if we just turn the light in like David and say, search my heart, oh God, and see if there's anything in me that will trip up what you're wanting to do in my life and uh, really focus on your character. It's more important your reputation, I can tell you. And so we see David, on the other hand, David is slow in coming to the throne. It's not an immediate thing. And, and David's given menial tasks. You know, we talked here a week or so ago about the importance of doing the menial things because it's in the menial things that our servant heart is developed. It's not in the great old big old stuff <laughs> because if you get the great old big stuff like Saul and your uh, character is not developed to hold it, then you're going to fall down. But David is doing menial tasks and, uh, and we see that he starts out as just a servant shepherd. He's just a shepherd. And uh, we saw the same thing in the life of Moses. He had to learn the smell of the sheep. Sheep had to learn his smell. He had to go with the people. How I many of you know it's important you go with them before you try to lead them? It's important you build a relationship with them before you try to get the permission to lead them, you know, and to carry out your position. How I many of you know it? Nobody really cares what they call you. What's important is who you are. <laughs> And so David learned how to serve. He learned how to serve. He was a servant shepherd. And, and even in Psalm 78, the Lord says, I brought you out of the sheepfold, David, that you could shepherd Israel with the skill of your head and the integrity of your heart. The word integrity means integrated. In other words, what it's saying is that you are who you are all the way through. Years ago, I taught a lesson. They was about 600 campers in this youth camp. And uh, they asked me to teach a lesson, and I, I don't know where I get some of this stuff, but I had a cannonball. I had a cannonball that somehow I'd come across, and then I had this black balloon, and I had the little doohickey where you blow it up between my fingers, and, and you held them up at the same size. You couldn't tell what they were. <coughs> Unless you had a pen. <laughs> and suddenly, if you stuck the pin in the balloon, you could tell where the cannonball was. But you could stick the pin in the cannonball all day. Because any way you diced it, any way you sliced it, it was cannonball. On the other hand, <laughs> the balloon appeared to be a cannonball, but it was just full of hot air. I know a lot of leaders like that. They don't have integrity. They just full of hot air. And they appear to be solid. Then the pressure's on. And they guard that. Most of the time you can tell because they're not approachable to people. They come on the scene, off the scene. You can't get to know these people because there's things that they're hiding. David, on the other hand, was just cannonball. He was just who he was. And he was a servant. And he was willing to do menial things. And God brought him out not to change his nature, but to change his position because his nature was correct. He was a servant shepherd. And he brought him to shepherd the sheep. So it's very important. Secondly, God promoted him to a warring worshiper. These are paradoxical terms in a way. But God brought him out to war. 
But he was in a tough spiritual position long before he met Goliath because God was bringing him to worship in the throne room and basically be a servant in the throne room that he would someday rule in. Listen, if you can't do the menial task, take it out the throne. As David had to be able to serve and worship because Saul was so vexed that he needed David's worship just to calm him down. And David was totally fine just leading worship, probably mopping floors, whatever it took in the presence of the throne room he would someday serve in. He didn't have his eye on the throne. It is eye on God. And he's the only one that can promote you. Please hear me. The Bible said it is the Lord that raises up one, takes down another. If you're trying to get promotion through your activity, I got a word for you. Quit. Quit thinking you deserve. In fact, I tell pastors all the time, anybody that feels they deserve the position is most likely disqualified by that. Because <laughs> if you're wanting a position, you probably don't need it because you're still too much alive. And so David, we see in, in 1 Samuel 16 that he comes to a place of, of worship and he's just worshiping God. And he goes to deliver cheese and ends up delivering a nation because God moves him to another stage. He becomes a courageous champion. And uh, what had really taken place in his life is he had fought other battles when he was alone. Now he's in public and there's a giant in the valley screaming out and defiling the armies of God. And David steps forward and says, who's going to take him on? And they're like, are you crazy? None of us are going to take him home. He's been screaming for days. And David said, isn't there a cause? They're like, listen, cheese boy. He is a warrior from his youth. Look at him. And David said, yeah, but y'all don't understand why I was just been faithful where I was. While I was just been faithful where I was, they, there come a lion out to attack the sheep. And my love for the sheep was greater than my fear of the lion. So I raised up and took him by the beard and turned him inside out and killed him through the Spirit of the Lord. And they're like, yeah, right. And he says, and then there come a bear. How many knows a bear is bigger than a lion? And your next battle will be bigger than your last one. That's why he gave you the last one, to build you up for the next one. <laughs> and you need to understand we're in war. And so what ends up happening is David had already slain the lion and the bear before Goliath ever showed up. And he didn't go there to fight Goliath. He went there to serve the troops. But God saw his heart. You better understand, God will owe no man anything. You serve him. I don't care if it's in a room with no windows. He knows where you are. He'll lift you up in due season. You don't have to worry about that. He'll make you known when you're prepared in your character and integrity. So don't, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about that. And so David becomes this courageous champion and he goes down. And it's a beautiful story, especially if you check out the history of how the shepherds carried a staff and how that in the bottom of the staff they actually carved in all of their victories because they were nomads and they would sit around a fire at night and they would look at the staff in the hands and they would point at a particular carving and all of a sudden they'd tell a story about that particular experience. And so you find out that they send David to Saul and Saul says to him, what makes you think that you are able to defeat this warrior? And David just points at his staff, look here. Look at the bottom of my staff. You see that line? You see that bear? And, and we, we go on in, in chapter 17 to say, well, he took five stones and he took a sling. You better read that again because the first thing it says in verse 40 is he took his staff in his hand because the testimony of yesterday was going to be the courage for today's battle. You need to understand his staff was as important to his victory as that sling and stone. Because God lets our testimony, we overcome him by the blood of the lamb and by the what? 
the word of our testimony. Everything God brings you through is to take you through what you're presently facing. And so David comes and he's a champion and he takes that staff in his hand. Why? Because he's fixing to carve in an ugly head. He knows where his strength is. And Saul, or uh, Goliath makes the battle about his own experience. He said, why you come to me like a dog? And David said, let me explain to you. If I was fighting you, you'd probably be victorious, but I ain't fighting you. This battle belongs to the Lord. He's putting me here. I know his voice. He put me here. He gave me a cause. And because he gave me a cause, you're fixing to have a bad headache. <laughs> yes. Because you're going to lose your head here in a few minutes. David knew where his strength lay. Now, how did he know where his strength was laying? It wasn't in his flesh. He wasn't depending on his size. He was depending on his God. <laughs> and he learned that in private. Boy, if we would fight more battles in private, we'd win a whole lot more in public. Can I get an amen? It'd be a difference in your life if you knew where your strength lay. And so David become a courageous champion. And then we talked of his faithful friendship with Jonathan. And the thing that's so beautiful about it, Jonathan was willing to cut a covenant with David and give up his rightful place in the throne. But you got to understand, David was totally fine with supporting Jonathan as the next king. He wasn't trying to jock for position. He was fine wherever you put him. I love leaders that are versatile and are happy wherever you put them. Amen? Just wherever you need me. Just wherever you need me, I'm fine. I'm not out to try to climb the spiritual ladder. Just wherever you can use me, I'm fine. And David was that kind of a friend. And then when it come down to where he could actually take out his enemy, his character and his conviction with God would not let him do it. I love David for the simple fact he wouldn't kill Saul to get the throne and he wouldn't kill Absalom to keep it. He put his destiny in the hands of God. He didn't try to defend anything. He didn't try to win anything. He didn't try to keep anything. How many of you know you can see his heart? He's, he's, he's cast all of his lots in with God. God, whatever you want to use me as. You know, if you want to, I'll serve Saul. And all these friends around him, they were trying to encourage him. Kill him, he's right here in your hands. <laughs> And David says, no, no, be it far from me to touch the anointed one. Even if he was anointed out of a bottle, and even if I know I'm anointed to take his place, I'm not doing that. I'm not going to do it by the hand of the flesh. Listen to me. That is creating an Ishmael when you come to position by your own fleshly desires. And if you create an Ishmael, you'll have to feed him forever, and it will keep you from your Isaac. Just understand, you have got to let God handle your promotion and never take it in your own hands to do away with those that stand in your way. Never do it. God is big enough to move them. And if he ain't, <laughs> you certainly are going to get in trouble trying to do it. And so he becomes a loyal leader. And then he becomes the king. Not just a king, but a king of kings in Israel that through his lineage come the king of kings forever. And so David becomes the king. Nobody talks about Saul. Everybody talks about David. Why? Because of his kingdom, there will be no end. Of his kingdom, there will be no end. And so what you need to understand is there's a huge difference between blessing and inheritance. Get what I'm saying here. Blessing can come to anyone, but inheritance, the root word of it is heritage. You can't have inheritance without those that be going before you and those that are coming after you. Saul was blessed to be king. David is blessed with an inheritance of your kingdom. There shall be no end. Listen to me. It's a whole lot more important that you're a link in a long chain than for you to be the top dog. <laughs> that your life outlives you. That other generations are affected by you. Much more important. Whatever you can achieve in your own life, 
simple phrase John Maxwell uses. Your success is determined by your succession and your successor. And David's victory became Israel's inheritance, his lineage. Now, I want to talk a little bit about that because now how do we use this? We see the Saul operating in the flesh. We see David operating in the spirit. We know that really in order for the Philistines to be destroyed, they had to quit fighting inside the house over who was going to be king. <laughs> so the inward battle keeps us from the real outward battle most of the time. You got to conquer the flesh before you can conquer the enemy. Please hear that. I can't teach on it because I can't teach on everything. <laughs> but that's very important to understand. If you can't conquer your flesh, believe me, you're never going to conquer the enemy without if you can't conquer the enemy within. And so David conquers the enemy within by waiting on God's perfect timing. Now, Jesus brings that to a place to where it's not just the history of Israel. It becomes a prototype of how we are to be servant warriors. And it's found in John chapter 13. And if you look at John chapter 13, verse 3 through 5, there's some scriptures here. Now, this is the last day of Jesus' life. He's going to teach five particular things that are important for us. How many of you know last words are important? If you're gasping for your last breath, you don't say, what's the weather going to be like this weekend? I mean, that's out of your mind. What you want is pertinent things of importance. And so Jesus, this is his last earthly day of ministry before the cross. He's teaching five things. And these five things are important. He's teaching us how to serve one another. He's teaching us, that's in John 13. He's teaching us how to encourage one another in John 14. He's teaching us how to be fruitful with each other in John 15. He's teaching us how to protect one another in John 16. He's teaching us how to pray for one another in John 17. These are pretty important lessons. If you're going to carry them out, you're going to learn to serve one another, encourage one another, be fruitful with one another, protect one another, and pray for one another. That's the only way you're going to succeed. And so what he's giving them is survival tips of how to make it as a team. Now in John 13, before it starts, I want you to look in verses 3 through 5. It says, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and knowing that he was come from the Father and was going back to the Father, he raised up from supper, laid aside his garments, took his towel, girded himself, and after pouring water into a basin, he began to wash the feet of the disciples and wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Now notice the precursor to him being able to do these things was threefold. He knew who he was. So when you're serving in a, in a war zone, it's very important that you're not in an identity crisis. You better know who you are. You better not be out there to try to prove you something that you're not. <laughs> That's no time. When a war zone's going on, he knew that he had come from the Father. The second thing you need to understand is he knew that God had given all authority into his hands. If you're operating without delegated authority, then you're operating with assumed authority. And then when you're tested, you know that you're not in rightful position. You didn't gain that legally. Nobody delegated you to be there. And, and, and I won't ask you for a show of hands, but I can certainly lift both of mine. There's times when I've stepped over boundaries I wasn't authorized to be in. Okay? And when you get out there and you're challenged, then all of a sudden you realize, okay, I'm a moron. So it's important to understand he knew his authority. He not only knew he'd come from the Father, he knew who his Father was. He also knew that God had given him all authority. And then last, he knew where he's headed. He knew that he was going back to his Father. Now, why is this important? Because these three elements can only come to you through fathers. Back to the heritage. I'm a Clendenin because my daddy was a Clendenin. And lo and behold, so was his daddy. And we did a genealogy check. Did you know all the way back to the 8th century, they were still the Clendenins? It's an amazing. In other words, my identity was given to me by my father before I even knew I had an identity. When I was a baby, my identity had been settled by my inheritance. 
and my lineage and that I was a part of something bigger than myself. These things are key important. If you're going to serve in a war zone, you need to know who you are. It's funny. They give you dog tags so you don't forget. <laughs> and so if they find you dead, they know who to hunt up. These are important things. And so your identity is important. These three things are passed to us from our Father, from our lineage, our identity. All authority come from the Father to Jesus. Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. There's a difference between power and authority, and you need to know this. Power is the force to rule. Authority is the right to rule. And you need to understand the difference. Somebody can give you power, but if they don't give you the right to exercise it, you're a figurehead. Authority means you got the right to do it. So Jesus knew where he come from. He knew who he was, and he knew where he was going. Now, why is that important? Why is that important if you're going to serve and encourage and be fruitful and protect and pray for people? Why is that important? It's important because... All of our warfare will be in line against one of those three things. And when you turn to Matthew chapter uh, 4, <coughs> ver <coughs> excuse me, verses 1 through 11, you'll find out that Jesus is taken into the wilderness and he's taken in there to be tempted of the enemy. And he's facing a full frontal attack from the devil. And the devil begins to tempt him in three ways. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I'm just going to tell you the three spirits that you would deal with in the course of your life and why it's extremely important that, uh, that you know these. Yeah, I am going to read it. Let's, let's go back, Deb. Let's read Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And then Jesus was led up of the Spirit into the wilderness. Everybody say led up by the Spirit. And... Into the where? You mean to tell me the Holy Spirit will lead me in the wilderness times? Yep, he will. <laughs> and Deuteronomy 8, 2 tells you why. So he can humble you, prove you, and see what's in your heart, whether you'll obey him. Wilderness experience is part of a journey towards a champion. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry, I would say. And the tempter came and said to him, if you be the... If you be what? Son. The son of God. Understand it's always about your sonship and whether or not you know who you are and you know what he's given you and you know where you're going. If, if you lose sight of that, the whole thing's about his sonship, the things that he had gained in his own journey. Now notice this. If you are the Son of God, then command these stones to become bread. Now, understand that there will be three spirits, basically, that attacks you. Now, I'm going to give these in the order of the way they actually are here. Because the first order is the spirit of seduction. Let's just go ahead and put up all three. What he's trying to do is he is trying to get Jesus to sell his future for a crust of bread. And you need to understand everything about your future. The enemy is waving a crust of bread, natural appetites. The only thing that can cause you to thwart your future with God is to give in to your natural appetites, whatever they are, for power, for position, sexual appetites, human hunger, whatever it is. That's the first thing he encounters. He encounters that. Now, the next thing he encounters is not just the spirit of seduction trying to buy his destiny, but the next temptation of Jesus is to confuse him. The spirit of confusion comes to try to cause us to not know who we are or where we come from. Now, I'm mischievous. How many of y'all figured that out? If you ain't, welcome a boy. But anyway, let me explain to you that I love to go up to little kids. I love little kids. And, and I love to find out what the kid's name is and say the kid's name's Charlie. And I say, it's so nice to meet you, John. And then look at you, my name's not John. My name's Charlie. Now, he's that tall. He knows his name's Charlie. And I'll just mess with him a little bit. I'm saying, oh, well, I'm so sorry. I, I'm just thankful to meet you, Sam. He's like, I'm not Sam. I'm Charlie. Oh, okay, Bobby. 
And, and about three times, finally, he put his hand, I, my name. In other words, you're not going to confuse me. I know who I am. Listen to me. It's very important you know who you are so the devil won't confuse you to think you're somebody you're not or somebody you're portraying in an image because it's not truly who you are in integrity. And you need to understand if he tried that with Jesus, he's going to try that with you. And you need to know who you are so you can stand against confusion and you need to know what your vision is so you can stand against seduction because those two of the three spirits that come at you, the third spirit that comes at you is the spirit of control. And the spirit of control will try to minimize your effect now. It's the battle you fight today. So the spirit of confusion comes against your identity. The spirit of control comes against you presently. And the spirit of seduction tries to buy your future. And if you don't understand that, you will either be in an identity crisis, you'll be confused, or you'll be exchanging power is what he offered Jesus for authority that Jesus already had. Now, why is that important? That's important because those things come to you in your relationship with the Father. I'm going to end with this little picture to draw this picture in your, in your mind. But when a Hebrew child is born, the Hebrew child spends the first three years with his mother. And in this three years with his mother, his mother tells him the, what we would call Bible stories. But in reality, what it actually is, is it's the history of Israel. Because David and Goliath's a story to us, but to them it was history. And so there was a three-year bonding time with the mother. And it's very important that a child has a three-year bonding time with his mother. It's extremely important. If they miss that three years and don't bond with their mother, something's missing all of their life. Now, at age three, when that baby was weaned, a strange thing occurred. Because the Hebrew mother would take the baby and dress it in the servant's garments. And they would bring in a guy known as a pedagogy or a bond slave. And for the next 27 years, that bond slave would work with this boy. <laughs> and this bond slave's job was to bring this boy through servanthood so he could actually be a ruling son. And they called him a male child. They didn't call him a son at that time. It was a male child. That's why when you're in the Bible, you find this male child. Now, at age three, when they assigned the pedagogy, the way the pedagogy taught this boy was there's letters and numbers corresponding in Hebrew. And so he would take honey and put it on his finger and stick it on the boy's tongue. And the sweetness of that, he would say to him, what you're about to learn is sweeter than the honey in the honeycomb. <laughs> and that's what's been spoken of in Psalms 19. In other words, he didn't have, you know, and I feel sorry for him, they didn't have him and him. Tootsie Rose, none of that. But they had honey. And honey was the way they motivated. I wish they'd have done that to me in school. I'd have been a straight A student if they'd have just motivated me with sugar. I love it. So anyway, they would motivate him to learn his letters and his numbers. Now, what happened was he would train this boy so when the boy went into Hebrew school at age five, he would have an understanding of the letters and number system so he would know how the Hebrew works. And any of you who's got a strong concordance knows that's still true. They have letters and numbers. Now, what he did was at age five, he would go to school with this boy, and then he would come home and he would drill him at night. And when he got there, they rubbed their hands on the board with honey and licked the honey off. And again, they were reminded, what you're about to learn is sweeter than the honey in the honeycomb. And from age five to about nine, this boy had to learn 24 books of law by memory. And this guy drilled him every day, still dressed in the clothes of a servant. Only difference was he had a purple thread through his garment. The pedagogy didn't have that. The purple thread indicated the guy you're raising up will one day be your master, not just your student. That's why children's church is so important. We're raising children of a king. We're not babysitting people's babies. We're teaching them to rule and reign. Are you hearing me? It's super important. I may be recruiting you some nursery work. But that's exactly what it is. We're raising up sons of God to rule and reign with him. And so at age nine, his father come into his life. And from nine to 12, 
the, the Mishnah had to be taught, not the Torah. The Torah had been memorized, but the Mishnah was the law of God that was from the mouth to the ear. It was so holy you couldn't write it down. You couldn't give him notes. It had to be mouth to ear from a father so he'd learn the voice of his father and not just the heart of his mother. And if you get a kid that misses his father from age 9 to age 12, they'll have, a missing, they'll have an orphan spirit. So these are things that they did. And at age 12, the father would set an appointed time and the boy would come before with the pedagogy and he would quote the oral and the written law and the father would adopt him. Now the word adoption we've westernized to mean that we take some child that's been disenfranchised, we try to make them feel a part of the home. But that's not what... It was in the Hebrew culture. The word comes from a compound Greek word, huihasphesia, which means the placing of a son in full rank that he may fully represent his father. And when that process was done, they no longer called him a child. They called him a son. And it's important to understand we have a lot of children of God, but they don't know the word of God to represent the heart of the father. Consequently, they have not operating in sonship. Consequently, they are prey to confusion. The spirit of control, they sell themselves to the spirit of seduction. But when the father heard him quote the written and oral law, he not only adopted him as a son and put him in full rank, he took off of him the servant clothes and put on him the robe. And the robe represented the father's identity. And then he took the ring off his finger and he put the ring on the boy's finger, which they sealed every document. And so it represented the boy's authority to operate in the place of his father. And then he would put shoes on the boy's feet, which represented his destiny so that he would know you're in this for the long haul. You have a purpose long after I'm gone. Jesus had went through this very process. That's why at age 12, he's already debating the scholars in the temple because that was the second step after bar mitzvah was to prepare and settle the law in your heart for liberalia. And then he was to learn the trait of the father and memorize even more of the cultural laws so that age 30 he could enter full vigor into what he was called to do. That's why these, quote, 18 missing years of Jesus, they're not missing at all. We got the indication that he was moving from bar mitzvah. He was wearing the robe of the father. That's why he said to Mary, don't you know I now need to be about my father's business? That wasn't a smart aleck statement. That was saying, now it's time for me to represent my father. I've been fully trained. Listen, this is important stuff. If you don't get a hold of this, you don't understand what's been said. So when the prodigal leaves home and spends his inheritance and he comes back home, he said, just make me as one of the hired servants. What was he saying? Dress me again, dad, in the servant's garments because I'm not worthy to be called your son anymore. But the father had mercy and said, go get my robe. Go get my robe and put a ring on his finger, shoes on his feet. I'm not going to let him walk in the shame of his failure. I'm going to restore him to sonship. Listen to me. If you ever heard anything I say, you need to settle the fact that you know your identity in God. Not in you, not in your flesh. Your identity resides in the Lord Jesus Christ. You are who he says you are. You have the authority he says you have. You have the destiny he designed for you. And if you try to operate in those things, contrary to the spirit, but in the flesh, you will become victimized by these three spirits. And you'll end up bringing a reproach to the Father. So Saul and David represents the flesh and the spirit. Jesus represented the spirit in the temptation of the flesh. And we have victory because of him. Thanks be to God, we have victory because he has overcome the world. So you're not just a follower of Jesus. You're a son of God, walking in the authority and power of the Holy Spirit, fulfilling the destiny to which you've been called. Don't let the devil change your name or give you a false identity. Let's pray. Father, I feel your spirit so strong, and I'm just so thankful to call you Father. 
And Lord, I know where I come from, and I know you changed my identity and even my name. And Lord, I know you've given me authority to operate in the realm you've called me to, and I know, Lord, there's a destiny that I'm not willing to sell for a piece of bread. No matter how much it appeals to the appetite, I'm not willing, Lord. And I want to be able to say to the enemy, it is written, it is written, it is written. I want to be a student that fully knows what is written, that I may fully represent my Father which is in heaven through the power of the Holy Spirit and not my own fleshly strength. Lord, help those that are listening today to get a hold of what I'm saying. Lord, I feel your Spirit so strongly. But Lord, I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, to continue teaching long after I stop. And seal these things in our heart by the Holy Spirit that your body would no longer be confused or powerless or without a heavenly vision of what you've called them to do. Help us to walk in your spirit and not after the flesh. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone in agreement together said, Amen. Amen.